the we know the base factor is consistent. So recall what I just said that we are going to weigh, weigh with these posterior probabilities if these two models. Now one of these two posterior probabilities is now going to be nearly one, the posterior probability of M2. So the rather complicated description simplifies to the following. I, I mean subject to certain niceties which I uh, which I'm not talking about. There are some some worries about remainders and so on, but let's forget that. So this as if uh, the base rule also knows that M2 is right because the posterior probability is very high, nearly one. So what the Bayes rule does is the following. It uh, compares the evaluations only under M2, approximately. So this is what the Bayes rule does because of this posterior consistency. Compare the two decisions assuming M2 is true. The Bayes rule knows M2 is true because the base factor will identify that. The posterior probability will be very high. Then there's a direct argument of this kind. So <coughs> this is what you have to compare then. For each alpha, there are two alphas here in Stone's example, alpha equals 1 and 2. This is what you have to compare under M2. What I've written is not entirely right. It's M2 and the data. So you do that computation, and uh, it turns out uh, that the difference of these two terms uh, is uh, what I should say. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, I've written that as AIC plus a negligible, negligible quantity. What I mean is that uh, the difference of these two valuations is the penalized least squares error where the penalty is AIC. So it's as if for each model, this conditional evaluation is the corresponding penalized least squares with the Akaike penalty. So, so when you choose the minimum of those, you are choosing as Akaike does. So that's what it says. So there are two computations. One is the posterior consistency, and the second part is this direct evaluation. This is for the, the Cauchy prior, and uh, there's a general result where when this becomes negligible. This, this is where there are some conditions on the prior. That's true about the Cauchy prior. Um, it would be true uh, for many other priors. And for the empirical base case, this is exactly zero. That's why. Uh, the empirical base is exactly, in fact, whether M2 is true or not, the empirical base is exactly like uh, the Akaiki. Uh, what I'm going to do now is say something about the base factor, and that's based on uh, uh, this paper which has just been written up. Uh, this is all about Stone's example. Uh, you may not be able to see these, but uh, I'll try to All right. Uh, <coughs> Sir? Yeah. The state models yesterday what we were talking about by putting the prior probability to take care of one model is Say it again, I, I didn't get. Nested models. In? The example that you consider yes. equal to zero mu belongs to R. Right. The prior probability that you're putting. Yes. Equal to half R. Yes. But oh. there is no. Oh, uh, it's, it's sort of regarded as a kind of default choice. Uh, 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 you, you could choose other things, but usually, if you do not know anything about them, you provide uniform probability, that's what is being done. It arises from testing problems where you expect that uh, the simpler model should, you do not reject the simpler model unless there's strong evidence against that. So the probability of that should be at least half. If, if you sort of argue that unless the data has strong evidence against the null hypothesis, you're not going to reject null hypothesis, that would translate into saying that 
the probability of H naught should be at least half. Uh, and because if the probability of H naught is small, say, you would have rejected the H naught without any evidence. But you're not doing that, so the probability of that should be at least half. So we are looking at a situation where uh, prior probability of the simpler model should be at least half. And uh, so at least in these model selection problems, whenever you choose this simpler model, you'd be choosing under more, uh, more probability under M2. But uh, so you should not make anything smaller than half. About bigger than half, I have no strong argument except to say that we are trying to leave, leave the decision to data, so the prior probabilities should be half half. That's, that's the basic idea. What about probabilistic consistency? What about? Probabilistic consistency, a bigger set of... Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> consistency won't depend on that, because what happens is the base factor is either zero or infinity. It's like a zero-one law. So as far as consistency is concerned, this half half does not matter. So. I think what he tries to say is that uh, these two are not desired. So probably how how could, uh, how how does it? I mean, it, I, I I'm also. If you oh oh the, oh disjoint. They are not desired. So how 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 do you put half half? Oh. Oh, I see. Oh oh. How about it? Sum is one. Yes. Is that what you're saying? So uh, uh, so in some cases, both hypotheses would be true. That's a possibility. Ha half. If yeah, M is zero, how so, you say. right? Frame. Or if if you uh, in, in this problem it does not matter too much because we put a continuous density. Yeah. Think of it as not equal to zero if you like. <clears throat> zero is so th that's a matter of uh, uh, yeah, just convention. So if you like, think of mu not equal to zero. Uh, the alternative is disjoint from the more complex model you pick out is uh, what remains after the simpler model is taken off. Is that what you meant? For why it should sum to one? No, not the sum. Like mu belongs to R. R is the entire. Uh, it's a much bigger right. set than mu equal to zero. So uh, the standard probabilistic law, like the superset, should have a lot. Oh, of but uh, we are looking at two disjoint models, and uh, even when you do testing of hypotheses, think of it this way: if we think of testing hypotheses, sharp null hypotheses. Uh, if we put a probability of uh, smaller than half, like very small probability of half, most of the time we'll be rejecting the null hypothesis. So uh, if you think of the practice of what frequentists do, that amounts to putting probability bigger than half. So it's, it's a sharp hypothesis, stands on its own, even though that does give rise to problems. I, I mean. I can see your, everybody has a problem accepting that because there are problems with that because on the one hand you have the full line, in the other case you have just one point. But that's the way it is. This one point is regarded as very important. Like uh, the example that I gave uh, when uh, Newton's theory was being challenged, there was, Newton's theory was already sort of accepted as probably not right completely, so it needed adjustment. Or the alternative was Einstein, that it has to be completely set aside and a new theory put in place. So Einstein was putting a single constant for gravitation, gravitational constant, whereas uh, not for constant, actually the deflection of light. And uh, these alternative views were putting a whole range of values. And uh, those were being regarded as status quo. You might find it a little easier to accept if you put a distribution on R. Once you put a distribution on R, you get just one distribution. If you put a distribution on mu, you get just one distribution for the x's. So under the more complex model, you get just one distribution for x's. And under the simpler model, you get also one distribution for the x's. So, so you're basically comparing two distributions. And the base factor is basically the ratio of these two distributions. A sort of flat distribution over all R. Prior is actually a mixture of discrete and continuous discrete. Right. Uh, actually, in the discussion, but Barbara, this particular example. <coughs> uh, in Stone's example, where we had either all, th there are p means, each 
mean replicated at times. And we had either the symptom model said all the means are zero, and the other one said all the means were arbitrary. There, uh, the difference between the uh, BIC, BIC2 means the penalized least squares for model 2 minus penalized mean square uh, for model 1. That's what this is. And an easy calculation shows that uh, <coughs> this log of the base factors this, uh, is uh, If r by log n tends to 0, r by log n means uh, n is rt. So r by log r into p tends to 0, then this is going to choose a wrong decision. So it's as simple as that. The inconsistency is simple as that, that whenever r by log n tends to 0, that means r by log r into p, p is bigger than r by log r, then it's going to choose a wrong decision, <coughs> the BIC. Here is uh, the Cauchy prior once again. And uh, I said that the Cauchy prior, being exchangeable, uh, has a, a definite <coughs> representation. So the Cauchy prior can be written as a, this is the product of independent densities, and this is a mixing measure. And uh, I said uh, yesterday that in these problems, if you take just independent priors, it's not going to work. And that's based on, based on wisdom that we have learned in the last 10, 12 years. It has to be exchangeable. <coughs> uh, here's the smooth Cauchy prior. Uh, the smooth Cauchy prior is uh, this one. So it's the beta distribution. That's the one that was proposed by Jim Berger. He thought this should behave better than, uh, than the other Cauchy pair that I just showed you. So it starts with the same product density, but as a mixing measure from 0 to 1. <coughs> and this one is uh, the same thing on a different scale, so just ignore that. So. Smooth Cauchy prior gives no probability to the tail, more than uh, No, uh, all right. Uh, I've forgotten now what it does. Uh, so uh, th there's some significance for this number t. Now what is t is like uh, reciprocal of the prior variance. Something like a, if, if you had independent mu's, then t is like uh, one over the variance. And that is what is being mixed in these. So if t is like. Uh, if t is t is zero, I, I think the problem comes from t equal to zero. So both in the zero and one. Zero and infinity. So the the main problem that uh, I'll tell you later why why the problem comes. It's it's, it's not giving more information to the uh, more uh, more prior to the tail. It's sort of truncating the uh, from zero to infinity to zero to one. I'll, show, I'll tell you why it fails. Uh, it's a sort of general phenomenon and easy to show. Uh, there are problems with this. Uh, uh, there are, of course, there are technical problems with, with the Cauchy prior. Uh, I showed you what a Laplace integration is. You find out where the integral is maximum, and then integrate in a neighborhood of that. Now, if the maximum is attained on the boundary, then you have a problem. 
you cannot do this. Uh, this uh, normal integration cannot be done. That happens with the smooth Cauchy pair, but you can still carry through calculations. You can still approximate uh, as uh, as uh, as in the that toy example. It requires a different kind of calculations, but not not too hard. It's, it's been done. So uh, that was not the problem. I mean, we could approximate the base factor well, uh, and uh, I'll just show you what the base factors are. But uh, if I have uh, unfortunately, I have not seen this paper for some time, so I'm not as well prepared as I should be. Uh, here is, uh, let's look at the smooth Cauchy prior. This SC means the smooth Cauchy prior. You notice that uh, the, the method of approximation changes on the, depending on the value of CP. CP is uh, 1 over P summation y bar i square i equal to 1 to p. cp is an observed value of a random variable. If cp is bigger than this, then the maximum is attained inside at an interior point, and, and the kind of calculations I showed for the toy example goes through. So this, uh, this line is the same as for the uh, Cauchy prior. But from here onwards, there are difficulties. And for each of these, you need different uh, kinds of calculations. <coughs> so they, they change depending on the value of CP. Uh, this is a theorem which simply says that uh, under the more complex model, the approximation to the base factor which I showed you last time for Cauchy prior uh, has this kind of approximation. The log of the base factor minus log of this, the one that I showed, is actually little of 1, not just big of 1. Now, why is that? That must be, uh, there must be so there must be something more here. Oh, here's, so here's this constant C. So what I showed you last time was up to here. And uh, what we have here is this extra C, which is this kind of form. So if you have this C in, then you get a little better approximation of that kind. So in all these problems, the C was found too. <coughs> but C does depend on the mixing measure. <coughs> under, the, under the simpler model, there's a more serious problem. You do not get such good approximations. So see what happens then. Under the simpler model, this sharp maximum has a problem. So the Laplace integration doesn't work as well as under the more complex model. And uh, you get weaker results. These approximations are now not little of 1, but only relatively so. So if you have this difference divided by this, then it's little of 1. But I'll show you some numerical calculations in a moment. Uh, I'll try to see, we, we had proposed a general BIC. Now let me see if I can get the general BIC. Oh, here is the general BIC. For these two models, here is the proposal for a generalized BIC. That means the difference between those log penalized likelihood or log penalized least squares for the more complex and the simpler model. And that takes this form. Uh, that that means this plus means if this is zero, if this is negative, you take this to be zero. If this quantity is negative, then uh, you take that first term to be zero. <coughs> uh, about uh, about a month ago, I've done some heuristic calculations, which seems which seem to indicate that this would be quite general, not just for this problem, but very generally. But I have still to sort of substantiate that. So. Is probably uh, a widely applicable new new uh, criterion uh, coming into existence, <coughs> and you, you see that uh, P plays a very important role. R is the something like a sample size replication that plays an important role, but so does P. If P were finite, P were fixed, then uh, 
you, you can see what's going to happen. If P is fixed, then uh, you can ignore this because BIC is typically ignored constant. So this would be ignored. This would be ignored. And then you would have th that becomes the penalty. CP becomes a constant, so that's out. So it reduces to the usual penalty, the usual BIC when P is small, when P is fixed. So that's, that's the general formula that would take care of, I mean, hopefully that would take care of the situations where both P and N vary. But in those cases, there would be something else, not this CP, something else. There might be more than one such quantities. So there's a new theory, uh, uh, new, new theory coming up, of which this would be the simplest example. <clears throat> That's the consistency theorem I was talking of last time. Uh, what it says is that uh, not just the Cauchy prior, but for any other prior for which the mixing measure is from, has support zero to infinity. Remember for the Cauchy prior, the mixing measure is from zero to infinity. It's sort of an exponential distribution. <coughs> the problem with the smooth Cauchy is that its mixing measure is from zero to one. And whenever that happens, you get inconsistency. So this is sort of dichotomy. If the mixing measure is from zero to infinity, you get consistency. If mixing measure of this exchangeable prior, if the mixing measure is only part of that, uh, it sits on part of that zero to infinity, then you get inconsistencies. And that's what makes smooth Cauchy inconsistent. Uh, let me show you some numerical values. Remember that uh, CP greater than 1 plus 1 over R is what forces the, uh, forces the maximum to be attained at an interior point. So that makes things easier. All other cases are more difficult. And you expect the accuracy to be also affected. So what uh, you see here are various values of CP. I think we had R equal to, I forget what was R here. Let me see, uh, R was either one or two. So R was probably two in this, uh, in these computations, R was probably two. Yeah, I, I think R was two. R was two in this computation. So uh, <coughs> these two were, uh, so uh, R one plus uh, one over R, so this would be uh, the sort of cutoff point from where you should be all right. These are the difficult CPs. And uh, what you see here are the values of the base factor as, uh, and what the base factor indicates is as the CP is one, CP is the criterion, like what the sum of squares of the means. So bigger that is sum of squares of the observed means. So bigger that is more evidence against the simpler model. and. Uh, uh, I, I think here the base factor is upstairs is the, not the density that I showed you. Upstairs is the more complex density. Downstairs in the denominator is the simpler density. So for bigger values of CP, it becomes very large. So you, you can see so what's happening. <coughs> uh, then uh, that's the BIC. It's hopelessly wrong, at least for these values. This is the BIC which Stone had used. You can see that it's quite off unless CP is very large. These are all negative, where these are large positive numbers. <coughs> so that's the uh, sort of uh, stupid BIC which nobody should be using in these problems. That's the generalized BIC which we proposed and sort of doing badly only for this bad CP, but otherwise doing reasonably. So from here onwards is doing quite well from this point onwards. 5.7 for 6.0 and so on. And 
notice that from 1.5 is doing fine 20.6 for 20.8 very accurate uh, the Laplace approximation seems to be more accurate than you can sort of justify by mathematical arguments I don't know why it's, it's a sort of mystery even in frequentist literature frequentists use Laplace approximations to get what they call saddle point approximations and it's known that is very very accurate it's, some people have sort of called uh, called it uh, small sample asymptotics <laughs> even for three or four sample size it does very well and we don't know why I mean the theory does not indicate it should be that accurate but it is uh, this is the one that uh, if you had kept P fixed but use the Schwarz type argument, the kind of argument that leads to a proof of BIC, validity of BIC, then you'd get something like uh, uh, R coming instead of N. That does better. As you can see, that does better. This is due to KWP is Cass, Wasserman, and Do Donna somebody, uh, uh, Donna Pol Poller. So it's those three people that are. Uh, what is that? I forget what this is, but a anyway, so that's something about how good the approximations are. What I have here to show. Uh, here are the same things for the smooth Cauchy, and you can see things are going to be worse. Uh, let's see. Uh, For the smooth Cauchy, the approximations are not that good. Uh, so even for 1.5, uh, it's, uh, it's no, it's 1.5 is still reasonable. <coughs> so, so not that bad. <coughs> but again, the BIC is hopelessly off. These things are not too bad. And uh, I forget what that last thing is. <coughs> but uh, the formulas are different in this case because the maximum is not attained at an interior point. <coughs> How does one prove these things? Uh, uh, the proof of these things, uh, I don't think I should try to do that. Uh, I'll skip the proofs. The idea of the, I, I just sort of quickly say what the idea of the proof is. Uh, the idea of the proof is as follows. Uh, I just give a brief idea. People, uh, some Bayesians know that under regularity conditions, you have posterior normality. The proof of this is exactly similar. Proof of these things are exactly similar. Uh, what you do is, uh, when the maximum is attained, you look at, I remember I integrated in a neighborhood of the maximum. There we use Taylor expansion. So on the one hand, we have the true integrand. On the other hand, we have the approximating function obtained by Taylor approximation. So there we have to calculate a remainder, and that's the usual Taylor type approximation, and we keep that. Then outside that, you have to usually divide up into two sets, one where the Taylor approximation is still good, and one where you don't think of Taylor approximation, but you need something more than regularity conditions. Remember I talked about a global condition. So the idea is that you have, in a small region, you use the Taylor, and then there are two other regions where in one place you use Taylor, it's slightly bigger than the very small region, like the small region is like log n by root n or log p by root p, some small region, then uh, plus minus delta, then a much bigger region. And uh, in this much bigger region, we use the global condition to show that the tails of the approximating function and the tails of the true function are small. So tails are small, and in the part that matters, very close to the maximum, the Taylor approximation is good. So uh, the approximation is fine. So that's the way this proof works. <coughs> that's, for, uh, that's for the case where the maximum is an interior point. The proof for the, 
for the maximum is attained at a boundary is similar, but the calculus, detailed calculations are somewhat different. In the boundary, you can't even do, do the Taylor expression. Um, beg your pardon? If the maximum is the boundary, you can't yes. even do the Taylor expression. No, uh, if the maximum is attained at the boundary, then what you do is uh, uh, the maxi at the maximum, the derivative will not be zero. So you cannot go to the second term. You have to expand and work with the first approximation. What then comes out is that you get something like a gamma instead of a normal. Not quite. It's more complicated than that. Because uh, in the, when the maximum is attained at an interior point, you got something like an approximating normal. You are not getting an approximating normal in this case. Uh, you'd get uh, the linear term, e to the power a linear term, that reminds you of either an exponential or a ga gamma, more generally a gamma. So something of that kind comes. But uh, it does require a different kind of calculation. The details are different. So you work with the first term. If the max so this is the one constant sign. If the maximum is attained at an interior point, then the derivative there must be negative. First derivative must be negative. So you use such facts and so on. Now, uh, in some cases, there are even more difficult uh, computations when, uh, anyway, let's not get into too much of those. Oh, here's um, some of the people that I've been mentioning, but uh, <coughs> uh, this is the paper where uh, Barger and Perici deal with the constant term. Remember that I've been uh, in the BIC, one ignores the constant term in the expansion of the log. And uh, for small samples, that's quite important, as Professor Zellner was pointing out yesterday. And uh, that depends on the prior. So the object there is to choose a prior, uh, which is somewhat like a Cauchy prior in a general situation. Uh, Jeffries had given an argument for choosing the Cauchy prior for n mu sigma square. And what Bulgarian and Perici were doing, but this was intrinsic to that example, Jeffries' argument. So what Bulgarian and Perici were trying to do is to show uh, if uh, you could find such a prior for general parametric families. That's what they were after, and that's done here. The part that they get in the uh, in in the case of n mu sigma square, the part that they get is not quite Cauchy, but somewhat similar. They've done calculations with base factors. You see that they're very close with the Cauchy and their choices. So, but uh, subsequently, Tapo Shamant and I have written a paper, which would hopefully ap appear in a volume for Sierra that JSPI is bringing out where you show that a slight change in their algorithm would actually produce the Cauchy prior of Jeffries. So, so that deals with s fixed P, n going to infinity, but this time your interest is in the constant term and producing priors of the Jeffries kind, an automatic way of getting priors of the Jeffries kind. Jeffries had an argument, suitable contextual argument for each of these, whether you could sort of get that in s partly automatic way. Uh, these are two papers of that kind. Uh, so here's another paper. That's the book of Jeffries to which uh, all of us are indebted. And uh, uh, this, 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 this is a paper of Cass and Wasserman in the JASA, but uh, I, I think we should have referred to Donna Pollard's paper. Donna Pollard's paper has appeared in Biometric either 98 or 99. I think we had not seen her paper yet when this paper was being written. That's a thesis. Uh, uh, maybe uh, instead of showing you the proof, oh, oh here's Donna Pollock too. That's uh, her thesis of 1998. And uh, Stone's counterexample is GRSS series B 19, and we have versus Zellner's paper. <coughs> uh, I'm going to show you a couple of examples uh, 
in model selection just to show you the power of these things uh, hopefully I can so here is uh, one of my favorite uh, examples this is where one should have a zero one loss <coughs> uh, this is taken from a very nice paper it's a very long review of model selection from the point of view of BIC by Cass and Raftery I think it appeared in uh, JASA 95 or around that. Cass and Raftery. <coughs> uh, it's uh, entirely based on BIC. So it's, it's like a testing problem, but uh, le let me illustrate uh, why it's not an usual testing problem. Uh, consider the following problem, uh, which appears in uh, what's called bioequivalence. So uh, the FDA runs into these problems from time to time. Uh, usually what we do, we have an old drug, and then you have a new drug, which the drug company claims to be better. So you, so you might say that the null hypothesis, the difference in effect is zero. Uh, the alternative is it's better or at least different, not equal to zero. So null hypothesis represents status quo. And the alternative is what you want to prove by using evidence in the data. Uh, in bioequivalence, there's a drug in the market. And then a drug company comes and says that my drug is uh, equivalent to that, has no toxic effects, does the same thing as this drug. So uh, the null hypothesis is now that the differential effect is 0. And the alternative is that it's not equal to zero. So the classical methods of testing hypotheses cannot be applied here. Uh, what, uh, uh, what the frequentists have done is to take recourse to an old theorem in Lehman's book, <coughs> which I almost never taught because I thought it was so unrealistic. And then in the last 10 years, I found this one case where it does. So this is what Lehman shows. Take a normal, take for example a normal distribution, any exponential is fine. And then we know that if you test theta equal to zero, against theta not equal to zero, there is no uniformly most powerful test. But suppose you look at this bioequivalence problem, which is now formulated as follows. The null hypothesis is that modulus of theta is less than or equal to some PSI number set by FDA. So modulus of theta is less than or equal to delta. That's the alternative. And uh, the null hypothesis is the complement of this, that modulus of theta is bigger than delta. Then Lehman shows there is a most powerful, uniformly most powerful test. But it's sort of uh, not satisfactory. So there has been an, uh, there's an UMP test which is being used, but it's not satisfactory. So uh, even frequentists like Breslow uh, complain that uh, one ought, ought to have a better solution. And he does say, that the Bayesian solution is better. Bessler is a very well-known biostatistician, but in this problem, he's not satisfied with the frequentist solution. <coughs> uh, it's a problem of that kind. <coughs> so th there was a problem about the about mutation. So, uh, uh, I have not read this today, so let me see if I can. Uh, there are hypotheses of two molecular biologies, that there's one strain of E. coli, a bacteria that all of us carry, and uh, it has a mutation leading to acetate utilization deficiency. Now, this is, I think, what was of importance, that uh, it's due to an error-prone DNA. Uh, you know, the DNA is, can be repaired. <coughs> and uh, I think their hypothesis was that it's an error-prone DNA repair mechanism. Oh, and let me see. Yeah. So that, that's what they were interested in. And this one says that it's due to most mutations occur during DNA replication. So, this is the alternative status quo. <coughs> and uh, also, 
This is from uh, their paper in 96. And what they then do is to just apply a BIC, and there's very strong evidence in support of the biologist hypothesis. So uh, th here is a problem which is uh, like bioequivalence, where the simpler model is what you're interested in. And the more complex model, uh, it can be formulated. Let me see if, if the next page shows something more. Okay. Let me show you yeah, something more here. <clears throat> so the, the, here is the kind of data that you get. Uh, data, for example, six, this one. B hat one is the proportion of uh, among cells selected to have other mutations. And B hat two uh, now, uh, I cannot at this time recall why uh, they translate into these, but, it, but I, I, it's easy to see, but at this moment I cannot. I, I think they were probably this selection was so that this would be where the DNA rep repair was so thought to be in trouble. So these were selected cells. And P had 2 was the sort of general mutations. So what is being said is that uh, P1 equals P2 versus P1 not equal to P2. So, so this is the simpler model. And uh, but that's the one that we're interested in. <coughs> so as I said, the usual frequency says don't apply. You have to use this alternative theory of Lehman, which people are not satisfied with. Uh, I think, uh, I, I don't recall now what this uh, was about. But anyway, so uh, the basic solution of this was very easy. Uh, using base factors, that, uh, you can actually don't even have to use a BIS. You can actually calculate a base factor and use that. and. Uh, it, they did show that the biologist hypothesis was true. Here is a second problem, uh, which is very easy to describe. Uh, and uh, because this is a problem that uh, uh, I've described last time. So maybe uh, oh. Here's the problem of pistol manufacturing. A pistol manufacturing factory came to ISI Calcutta, uh, our SQC quality control division. They had 60 to 60 percent, 60 60 to 65 percent rejection rate. <coughs> and uh, so they wanted the ISI to find out which of the five parts in a pistol, I think they have parts like the barrel, the magazine, the slide, and two others, which was at fault. The uh, they themselves thought it's probably the magazine. What was done by uh, the quality control division, uh, there's now a paper written on this, but uh, I don't have it with me. <coughs> he used the traditional methods of analysis of variance. So this is what he had done. He had uh, used what are called fractional replication designs, orthogonal arrays. He had taken eight bad pistols and eight good pistols and then disassembled. So you get uh, eight pistols with five potentially bad parts and eight good pistols with five good parts. He thought of each part as a factor in design of experiments, which might cause variation or defect, with two levels, a level that he called good, that means the part was coming from a good pistol, and the level that he called bad, meaning it was potentially bad, coming from a bad pistol. And then, so you have five, a five-factor experiment, each at two levels, zero and one. And uh, when you, what he did was, uh, each rep replication was to combine some of the bad parts with some of the good parts, each factor according to the design, specified by the orthogonal array. Then he carried out this design and uh, uh, and he found that uh, uh, the barrel was the cause uh, of the main cause of the problem. The, uh, the company was not satisfied they, because they thought the magazine was at fault. So they asked him to sort of confirm. And he did another orthogonal array with 
16 more such pistols so that you had a full replicate. If you have two five factors, then altogether you need two to the power five, 32 pistols to have each factor at both levels. He did it a second time, and again he found the barrel was at fault. So, so the company was satisfied, and they did change the design, and uh, the rejection rate came down to five percent. Shugoto himself was not satisfied. He, when he did the second analysis, he thought there might be some effect of the magazine or the slide in addition to the effect of the barrel. So he came to me and Bika Sina, who is an expert on designs, to analyze the data. Uh, it immediately struck us that uh, uh, the whole method of classical designs, or as adapted by Taguchi, was quite inappropriate in this example. It was quite inappropriate because there was no real error. Uh, each pistol, there's no error in the response. You could classify each pistol as good or bad without any error by just trying to fire. If it fired well, it was good. If it did not fire well, it was bad. So that was not the case. Moreover, there was no additivity. You know, in linear models, you need an additive model. There was no additivity. So what uh, Shugoto wanted to do was to try out these uh, randomization techniques, uh, bootstrap, re replication, bootstrap, or uh, what not, uh, this permutation taste and so on. But for such complex problems, uh, even sim sim a simple problem like this is too complex for randomizations, for randomization per permutation distribution. So it doesn't work. I mean, I did try. I'm not a Bayesian, so I don't do those. But uh, for him, I did look into that. So I suggested, why don't we try to be model-based and use Bayesian methods? Uh, so this is what we did. Uh, <clears throat> suppose you look at uh, the following two possibilities. Th these are two models that we looked at. The barrel and the magazine are at fault, causing problems. Or the barrel and the slide are at fault, causing the problems. So these are two models. And then what you do is you, you calculate the, uh, so, you ca so this is the, so uh, the model is that uh, if you select from the production process a pistol at random, then P1 would be the probability that the barrel is uh, faulty, and P2 is the probability that the second component, magazine or slide, is faulty. So, so these P1 and P2s are like the theta that is showed in the more complex model. Here there are two models, equally complex. They both involve P1 and P2, the barrel, and either probability that the barrel is faulty or probability and the probability that magazine or slide is faulty. So two-dimensional models. These are not tested, unlike the example that I've been showing. But given P1, P2, you can calculate the probability of the data it's not easy to calculate, but you can. I mean, you can calculate the probability of the data from for these two models. You can also try to estimate this piece. We, we try to estimate the probability of these three estimates, and this is what happened uh, by method of moments. Then what we found was that P1 was like probability that the barrel was at fault was like 40%. The probability that the magazine was at fault was like I forget the exact numbers, between 20 to 30 percent. And the probability that the slide was at fault was negligible, 0, 0.00 something. So your reaction would have been that it's pretty sure that the barrel and the magazine were involved, but not the barrel and the slide. But we did what I said was a sort of Bayesian analysis, not quite Bayesian, because uh, my other two co-authors were not Bayesian, so that they were not ready to. But in this case, it did not matter. I'll tell you why. So what we did was, instead of uh, to do a full-fledged Bayesian analysis, I would have had to put priors on P1 and P2 and calculate the probability of the data under each of these two models and then calculate the base factor. Now what we did was to, for each value, each pair P1, P2, we calculated the probability of the data under the two models. And somewhat surprisingly, I don't know why, uh, the ratio was always between 10 to 15 which would mean no matter what bar you put, the base factor would be between 10 to 15. 10 to 15 in favor of the barrel and the magazine. So there was some evidence that the barrel and the magazine were at fault, but not the barrel and the slide. 
but not as strong as indicated by the method of moments. Uh, so these are the kind of problems which uh, you can solve by model selection, but you cannot solve by classical theory based on normal models. It also shows why in such things as generalized linear models, there will be lots of scopes for applying model selection methods rather than classical things. Uh, so this would be, uh, in, in suppose we have two parts which are bad, then this would be uh, something like uh, probability of a bad pistol would be, I think, that's the probability that a randomly selected barrel from the process would be bad. And that's the probability that a magazine would be bad. And this is the probability that at least one of them would be bad. And that's what you need for this. And then you have to calculate the probability that a barrel is bad. So this would be uh, what? Uh, P1 into 1 minus P2 plus P1 into P2 divided by So there's randomness coming from there. So that's one source of randomness. That the, this barrel may or may not be bad, but it has a probability coming from, uh, from th this kind of mechanism. There's another source of randomness because the bad parts were allocated at random. So there's a ra probability coming out of randomization. That's the part which is more hard to calculate. So the calculations of probability is not is elementary but interesting. <coughs> I, sh I should also say that uh, in these problems, uh, uh, the orthogonal arrays are not the right designs. Uh, for example, we found that if you had eight pistols, then uh, eight bad pistols, if you start with, you could uh, be sure to find which two parts were wrong by a better design making only 15 pistols. So with 15 pistols, you could be sure which two parts were wrong, which you, there would not have been any doubt. You would know for sure that these, so uh, I, I sort of think of the problem that we solved as children. There are eight, eight balls which look exactly the same. There's, all, there's one which is not similar to the others, and you can weigh and fi find out. So what is the minimum number of weighings by which you can find out uh, one in eight, uh, one in eight uh, balls? I think it's comes from information theory, it's like log eight. Uh, you, you, probably three, three balls, log, log eight to the base two, you can find out from three. And it, it cannot be less than that. And usually it's equal to the number given by information theory. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting different area with lots of potential. I, I know that the uh, Bell Lab has been exploring such designs uh, for uh, looking at uh, testing networks. They have huge networks and they want to test these networks for, for proper functioning. And uh, they found that what they would, there's no error there. I mean, there's, there's no error in response. The main problem there is where the problem lies. If there's a problem, it's a problem due to signals, not due to uh, errors. So what they do is uh, they check that every pair of nodes uh, you can communicate. And if that's all right, then uh, the whole network is all right. So they have to have readings where all combinations occur at least once. The smallest number of observations where all pairs of nodes occur once. And these new designs are being made by, as you can guess, information theorists and community mathematicians, uh, not yet statisticians. Hopefully, they'll come. Uh, I think I'll stop with this.